So with no further ado, we're, I'm going to hand over to the main event tonight, uh, and that's Ricardo Suarez, Principal Advocate in Open Source at Amazon Web Services, who's going to talk to us today about the robotic operating system. Thank you. Um, Ricardo, over to you. Okay, yes. So I'm going to talk to you about an open source project called ROS, Robotic Operating System, which is nothing like what it appears because it's not an operating system. But before um, I, I talk about that, I, um, I've been working in tech for about 30 years uh, and ever since having kids and my kids discarding toys, I found uh, a new hobby, uh, which basically is to take the toys that I don't want to throw away because they're too good and typically attach Raspberry Pis to them or Arduinos to do things. So the moving um, uh, picture was from 2014. It was my first attempt to create an autonomous vehicle, which, um, as you can tell, is probably about as good as my driving gets. Um, I the, the Mustang was a, a, a later version of that, which I then converted to what's called pie in the sky, which is I went into the shop and got 50 helium balloons uh, and tried to launch my pie into the sky uh, to take videos, which all went horribly wrong. Um, and the, the current project, which is to take an old candy claw thing um, and create an AI version that will uh, it's currently hooked up to my Alexa, so I can control it with my, my Alexa. And I'm going to create a model that allow me to fill it with sweets and it will know how to pick up a sweet for me. So that's my current project um, using, again, the, the Raspberry Pi, which you can see there. I'm not particularly good at this stuff. Um, Sorry, Ricardo, I, I had to add this. By saying Alexa, you just added um to my shopping list. But I just thought <laughs> I'd let you know that. <laughs> Thanks okay. for that. <laughs> okay well i'm sorry about that i should i should i should uh, i should call it something else in future this is not the first time today yeah i, I it's not the first time today <laughs> yeah so uh, apologies for adding an um to your shopping list um but my day job is actually um i speak at tech conferences i write blog posts on tech uh, specifically open source i've been working with open source for 20 years and, and so that's why I'm particularly interested in, in really the combination of uh, kind of open source and kind of making technology. So I don't tend to like presentations. Um, so I've drawn a picture. Um, and so I'm going to use the picture to kind of drive the story. Um, but I will come back to slides because some things I can't draw very well. OK, I want to start off, though with actually defining what is a robot. Uh, because actually, when you think about it, probably if you ask kids or if you ask anyone what a robot is, they probably have got their own <coughs> definition. Um, but specific in kind of the customers I work with and in academia and in research, it typically means three things. It is something that can sense. So it might have sensors that can understand and get data from its surroundings that it can actually use that information and do some kind of computation. And then based on that computation, it can then do something. So we have this kind of sense, compute, and, and act. Um, and I'm gonna kind of slip into slides. And uh, there is a much more pretty version of that. Uh, and it's interesting because when you apply that let me just remove this uh, thing here because this is a bit annoying. All right. Okay. Yeah, it's better. When you when you think about that, um, a robot isn't typically you know kind of what you would think. It actually encompasses a lot of different areas. It could be your traditional robot-like thing, uh, but it can also be other more interesting ones. One of my favourites is the autonomous walker, which I'm going to talk about a bit later on. But also in cover, it covers drones, um, which if the Demo gods are kind. I'm going to show a demo of that, um, as well as things like uh, self-driving vehicles and vehicles that are running off planet. And again, um, I did try and get the demo that we did with um, with NASA um, on building the, uh, the the NASA Mars Land Rover, but I couldn't get it working in time. Uh, but 
it's interesting they actually used uh, the robotic operating system to help them design um, the robotic arms that actually were used um, on the on the Mars rover um, that's that's probably tootling around there as we speak. Uh, so it's kind of it's kind of an interesting kind of kind of area. I can see there's some questions, but or chat. So I'm not sure if there's any. So I'm yeah, okay. Cool. Right. I'm, I'm relying on you to to to, to keep me uh, to keep me uh, on on the straight and narrow. So kind of that's kind of what I, what a robot is, right? I want to move on from that to kind of explore kind of the growing interest in this space and also some of the applications. So I've talked about what some of the robots look like, but it's also interesting to see actually who's using them and also in what industries, because you may have a kind of idea or thought as to where you traditionally think of robots. So it'd be interesting to, to actually maybe get some ideas. Where would you typically think robots would, would be right factory tick anyone anyone else want to give a novel oh, dangerous environments tick yeah over there any any ideas homes gardens yep the kitchen most absolutely definitely in um in the far east they've got uh burger flipping robots you know yeah. So, so factories, absolutely. They make cars. They've been making cars for many years. So, you know, when you think about it, there's that they, they kind of operate. And I've, I've put some of the things in the, in the color blocks there, right? They're, they're operating in, um, in loads of different um, environments. But when we look at kind of like some of the, the, the kind of the reasons why this is happening. So here are some of the industries, right? So, you know, in Kent, Garden of England, lots of farms. Um, agriculture actually is a growing area, especially in, in areas that are more hospitable and harder to farm, like deserts, for example. Um, you know, their um, robots can actually revitalize um, and create growable um, land from inhospitable areas. So, you know, it's part of feeding the world. Robots are, are, are important. But all these other areas, um, I know, are, are super important. But the key thing here is that there's a lot of interest and a, and a lot of interest typically means into a lot of investment uh, both in money but also in companies wanting robotic expertise wanting robots um, uh, to actually use and um, this is kind of an interesting graph okay so over time uh, and this is actually not just true of robot prices but you know internet of things uh, computers um, you know, the cost of labor of, of humans doing activities is a, you know, is a, is a kind of a, a graph that goes up. But a lot of the, the stuff that we can create to automate that, that might start off initially expensive. The early robots cost a lot of money. But now through commoditization and mass production, the, pri the unit price of those devices comes, comes a bit lower. The technology that's powered by open source means that it's actually cheaper. So you have this kind of gap now between how much it takes a human to make something versus how much it costs a robot to do something. Now, what you shouldn't read into this graph is, oh my God, you know, all our jobs are going to be taken by robots. The fact is that's absolutely not true. Um, what this means is all the boring jobs that humans shouldn't be doing will be done by something else and humans will have more interesting jobs. That's my, my, my view anyway, and I, I absolutely fundamentally believe that. Um, as a technologist, um, thank you. Um, it, it's been my, what I've seen over the last 30 years, you know, when, when computers uh, kind of become, became commonplace in, in, in the workplace, you know, the, the, the people uh, who were doing manual ledgers didn't think they were gonna be out of job. When word processors became popular, typing pools didn't, you know, suddenly disappear and the typists go away. They just upskilled and became PAs and secretaries, a better job rather than sitting in a dungeon just typing out every day. So the, the takeaway really here is that ro robots really are our friends and they're helping us to improve both the quality of life, the quality of what we can produce, but also um, help us to, to have better jobs. So let's look at some of the robots that you can buy today, including my favorite one, the Leah. 
Dutch company. Um, they produced the, the uh, smart Zimmer frame. Um, and this is packed with sensors and robotics. It was designed using the robotic operating system. And what, what is, what's really interesting here, okay, is that it's been designed to help patients uh, recuperate and recover more quickly. Because what this is, this is an always on assistant. So as you're recovering, it's um, taking measurements and sensors from your from, from you, you yourself. Um, and it's helping you uh, by collecting data, feeding that back to the doctors who can um, monitor review and then uh, suggest alterations so you get a, a good recovery. Um, for, uh, it's also used, um, uh, it can do some things such, such, such as when you go to your bed in the evening, it will take itself off to recharge. And then when you call it, it comes back to you so that you can then start doing it. So it's, it's a really nice, um, uh, you know, product um, uh, from, from, uh, from this uh, company in Holland. Um, one you may be more familiar with is uh, the iRobot. Anyone got a, ro a, ro a robotic vacuum cleaner? Maybe a Dyson or something like that? You've got one down there, have you? It's German. Which, which one is it? Is it an uh, iRobot, is it? No, it's not. It's, um, a, uh, what is it called? Um, Tezel or something? Right, like Tezel, okay. Well, well, that's cool. So, mm. so um, iRobot have been using robotic operating system to uh, effectively... Um, accelerate how quickly they can create robots because um, I'm, I'm going to come to this in a minute when you think about the process of creating robots it can take a long time and it's very complex and so what they've done and what actually the robotic operating system is it allows you to digitize all of that create simulations such as this lovely apartment and then test your robot so that you can create infinite apartment types, infinite types of furniture layout, and see how your robot um, uh, beh behaves. And so this is a running simulation. So you can see obviously the patterns of the robot, the vacuum cleaner. Um, you can see that even though this is all digital and it's all in a simulation, the sensors are still providing back the information that you would, that a real uh, virtual, uh, a real physical robot would give. And this obviously then allows you as a developer of that robot, to use that information to enhance the algorithms, to enhance the functionality. Now that's all done in software, no hardware. Right. No, so this, so you, you still have to think about that because that's still part of the robot. Um, it, it may become clearer later, but effectively what what you have to do is you have to create a digital representation of it. Of, yeah, and, and now, and that's where Ross comes in because what Ross is, uh, I'll, I'll leave that to, 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 to in a second rather than jump ahead. Now, this, is, this, this basically means, you know, if you're in the business of creating any kind of devices, um, you know, robotic operating systems and the digitization of this can help you go to market much faster, can help you iterate on your product much faster. So it means you create better products, okay, more quickly and at cheaper cost. So, you know, what's, what's not to set up? There are some more unusual kind of robots. So this one is a robot that is helping uh, teams. Uh, if you like baseball, um, it's not as good as cricket, but uh, hopefully I've not upset anyone. <laughs> um, but um, this is a company and I think this is, this is a better, this is a better uh, video of it, that uh, was desi designed using uh, Ross operating system and can pitch a ball based on a uh, number of different training programs to help uh, the bats people um, kind of uh, be better, uh, I guess, hitters. Um, another area that is... Um, big and I think that's already mentioned is in manufacturing. You've probably all seen videos of the uh, concrete 3D printer. Um, so that is, you know, those are being designed using a robotic operating system. Um, but it's not just concrete, it's things like dem demolition and kind of like on, on that as well. Uh, if you've got very kind of dangerous environments such as energy plants, this is, this is Wood Woodside, they're one of the biggest um, energy providers in Australia. Um, 
this entire um, facility is a real physical facility, but they've created a digital version of this and I've got robots. Yeah. Is that working, is it? Hopefully I won't, I won't um, drop out. So what you're seeing here is um, actually the sensor data from the simulator. Um, so it's interleaving the real footage of it actually um, running with actually the simulation on how this robot was developed. So someone created the, the, um, the uh, representation uh, of, the, of the site. Um, they developed the robot, including a physical representation, a digital representation of it. And then this allowed them to see how it would actually function uh, in, in the real world. Um, and of course, I work for Amazon. So we uh, are using robots quite significantly. If you're interested in actually seeing these things in action, Tilbury um, Fulfillment Center, do tours. You can actually rock up and you can actually, um, well, you can, you've got to go online and book a tour. And then you do the full on, uh, this is how our fulfillment centers work. And I recommend them. They're really cool. Uh, you can even do school trips. Okay. Uh, so if you work with kids, um, it's super interesting. Right. Okay. So, yeah. Um, and, but we, we do have other robots as well. Um, uh, I've, got, I've got too many, too many, too many um, uh, of these pictures, but we've got these kind of other, other robots that are doing things like packing boxes, taking boxes from the, the delivery um, and, and putting them in the pods, that kind of thing. So we're continuing to experiment um, with, with uh, ro robots in different areas. Um, so obviously Amazon is, is doing some interesting stuff here. Um, I've already mentioned this one. NASA um, are using uh, the robot operating system to help them design robots. Because if you think about it, you can't really prototype and design a robot easily uh, for Mars, right? You've got to do it on Earth. Mm. Uh, and so it, what this means is that you have to create very realistic um, representations of where you want the robot to be. In. And uh, it's a shame I haven't got the demo working, but we've, uh, it was actually a challenge uh, we did, I think, a couple of years ago um, with NASA uh, to help uh, create out new algorithms for the Mars rover to go from point A to point B. Um, and we developed this kind of realistic Mars terrain, a model. And then uh, we also created a more fun one, which actually I'm, I've, I've shared a screenshot of it, where we have this kind of big green blow up alien. Uh, and uh, the idea is for the Mars rover to find the margin, Martian using you know, AI and the camera's uh, sensor. So it's a lot of fun. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't get it working. So right, back to the, back to the drawing. So I've shown you a little bit about um, some of the use cases. So it's kind of interesting, right? I think it's an interesting space and it fits kind of geek stuff perfectly, I think. Um, so I guess coming back to, you know, why, why now, why robotic operating system? Um, we have to kind of, first of all, realize some of the, some of the challenges around building robots. Um, and I've kind of put them into three buckets here. The first one is that in order to build a, a robot, you have to have skills in lots of different areas. Um, so, you know, depending on the kind of robot you, you are creating, you're typically going to need kind of some kind of mechatronics uh, or physical type of um, engineering expertise. If you want to do, if, you're, if you want your robot to be able to kind of function by itself, you typically need navigation skills, wayfinding. Um, and that includes mapping and it's a field all in itself. It's quite fascinating. Um, if you want your, if you want your robot to actually be able to interact with the environment using video and audio, you need kind of to integrate computer vision as well as AI services. Um, and then you've actually got kind of all the glue that goes together for all those things. Right. So when you think about what goes into a robot, it's actually a lot of skills, a lot of knowledge. Um, and, um, Kind of together with that, the tooling, it used to be, in fact, it, it still is. In, when, when I first started doing Raspberry Pi stuff, you could go on to um, uh, GitHub or, or whichever one you prefer. And there's loads of really cool projects, loads of really cool tools to help you create fun little robots. But the problem is that these are very narrow and they'll help you do one or two things or they'll help you integrate with one or two devices. And so there's this kind of like, you know, Cambrian explosion of all these projects and they don't necessarily work well together. So um, whilst you can do some things well, getting them to speak with other things is hard. So getting the tools 
all set up working nicely together to achieve the aim of what you're trying to do was hard. On top of that, you then got the fact that a lot of the, the robotic stuff is expensive. Um, so a LiDAR um, sensor used to cost thousands. You can now get a decent one at Alibaba for about probably $30, $40. Um, but that is pretty good. Um, but even, even only a few years ago, um, I've got a couple of waffle bots. The, the LiDAR sensor on that is the most expensive part of it. It's like $399 just for that one sensor. Um, when you put it into, in, in, uh, with the motors and everything else, you're looking at you know, a lot of expense. Um, if you're doing more specialized things, you know, uh, it, it, the, the, the costs kind of go even, even higher. So um, where you can avoid physical hardware, obviously you can avoid those costs and, and reduce you know, how quickly you can create. So that's kind of three things. But then once you've kind of done that and you've got your robot and you've created it, there's a couple of other things that, that you know, um, come into this. And the first thing is that managing one robot, you can probably manage. But how do you manage 1,000, 10,000, 100,000? You know, we, we, we manage thousands of robots in our performance centers, okay? And, you know, doing that at scale requires a completely different approach. And also, then the last piece really is, Kind of like creating your V1 of your robot is one thing. But, you know, at Amazon, we have this saying that, you know, when you launch something, that's the beginning. You know, the real work starts there because you've got to basically start improving it, listening to your customers, getting their feedback, uh, and then updating and iterating on that. And actually kind of this is kind of the diagram here. The typical kind of like workflow, which I think I've got a better, a better version of that in, um, in, 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 uh, in slides. So... Um, so I think I've, so this is a, this is a kind of, this is the, again, just summarizing the, the challenges, okay, around, uh, robotics. And if you, if you think about kind of like the typical flow that I've just talked about and what roboticists do is that first of all, they will think about and design a prototype. Um, then they'll actually go and have to manufacture the components. Typically on those components, they'll have chips, they'll need firmware. So you have to develop the firmware, deploy the firmware, maybe even uh, create uh, device drivers. And then you have to integrate all those components together. And then that's just the robot. Then you have to build the application that sits on that and then uses and interacts with all those, all, the, all those things. And so that's, uh, that's a lot of moving parts, okay? And um, so try and put it into comparison, okay? That those are all kind of very much bespoke, tailored pieces. And what we want to try and do is we want to try and, you know, use the kind of Henry, Henry Ford model of trying to um, decompose this into, into pieces that you can more easily um, work with and, and create almost like an assembly line with easy to understand um, interfaces, um, easy to understand and standardized ways of interaction so that effectively it becomes just like Lego. Right, there's lots of different Lego parts, and it's just a case of how you put them all together. And so, um, oops, I'm not sure why that picture has not working. So, so when it comes to you know um, the robotic operating system, which I'm going to formally introduce in the next slide um, as what it is, you know, it, it's kind of like it helps you do these kind of these steps. As a roboticist, you want to create and develop your robot. It helps you build a digital version of your robot. It then bundles everything you need and then puts it into a simulation environment. So you can actually do all of that on your computer without having to, to, to buy any physical um, hardware. So now very, very quickly, if you wanted to create a robot to do something here today, you could do that, no problem. Um, and then uh, make sure that um, it was working to your specification. Uh, you know, so, so that's kind of like what we're kind of talking about. Um, so what actually, how, how do we, how do we solve this? So how we solve this or the solution, um, is uh, a project that came out, I think 17 years ago out of, um, academia and research called the robotic operating system or ROS. It's a bit of a misnomer because it's not an operating system. The robotics operating system is middleware. So it means that you deploy it onto an operating system. So ROS one required uh, Linux, Ubuntu specifically. So we can actually see up here. Um, 
and then more recently, Ross 2 has, um, has come out. And uh, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about Ross 2 in a second. But um, Ross has kind of like, um, is constantly being developed by the open source community um, and companies and manufacturers who are using, uh, using it. And uh, like many operating systems, they have these kind of this funky kind of naming convention, uh, which goes up in letters. So kinetic, melodic, meatic, which is the current version. Um, uh, of ROS one, uh, and uh, I've got I've got the kind of the official list actually um, uh, coming up, and these are kind of like bundled up uh, versions of the robotic operating system. But actually, what it is, in a nutshell, is this system that um, allows you to uh, effectively put together nodes, and a node uh, in in context of ROS is almost like a, a Lego block, right? It's code that typically um, will interact with some kind of device. Like it could be a wheel, a servo, um, a, a robot arm or something. Okay. Um, but it encapsulates all the, the things that that physical device does. And it exposes it um, on what's called a message bus. And the message bus is how you get one of these nodes, one of these building blocks to communicate with another building block. So if I've got a steering wheel, that'll be one node. And I might have an, uh, 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 a steering rack, which is another node and a steering wheel, uh, a, a wheel on another node. And by me turning my steering wheel, that would send a message on the bus from my node to a topic which basically says less. So topic is how you send messages between these nodes. And then another node will be listening on that topic and says, oh, that message is for me. I'll take that message. I've got to do something with this. And it will then basically interact with its hardware to, to know what to do, right? Now these nodes typically are written in C uh, or Python. So um, those, that's, kind of the, that's the kind of programming language of choice for, for ROS. So the lower level stuff um, and the nodes tends to be done in C, C++. Um, and then more recently, um, Py Python is pretty much kind of the, the, the kind of high level uh, scripting language that I think a lot of the kind of applications now are, are putting together the nodes um, to create these applications. So that's very kind of very quickly what it, um, uh, what it, what it does. Now there, I, I've very, I very much simplified. It's not supposed to be a tutorial on ROS, but the kind of the kind of key, key takeaway is that what, what it's done is that it's simplified and kind of homogenized and standardized how you as a hardware vendor can create drivers for your things that can be used in a robot. Um, and it's made my life as a device driver um, developer easier. Um, but also it means that I create um, a digital version of these, which means that I can now test this out in a digital environment and test my robot to see how it's gonna function before I actually put it together on a physical device. Um, and actually I've got uh, a slide uh, coming up, which actually kind of just kind of covers some of the, the kind of key features. Now, Ross came out uh, out of academia, um, but because it got a lot of traction and it solved an important problem, um, businesses and manufacturers started getting really interested in Ross. But there was a problem. And that problem, anyone want to guess what that problem was? Sorry? It's open source. So licenses tick in the box for that. Anyone want to guess what the, anyone, anyone on the phone, any, on, on the Zoom, got any? Uh... No, nothing, in, uh, nothing in chat, but uh, if you've got any questions on Zoom, please put them in chat. Oh, OS X and Windows. Well, there's one. There's one. Too many cooks. Working on it. Uh, okay, no, that's not. Uh, that was actually that's that's the benefit of open source. We want more cooks. Um, so the, the the problem actually was there were two. The first one was security. Okay, um, Ross came out of academia. They just wanted it to work. They didn't really think about security, which means it's pretty trivial to um, hack uh, robots on Ross. Okay, um, and I've had a lot of fun doing that uh, in the past. Um, the second is that they didn't really have um, reliability 
um, and quality built in. There was no quality of service kind of capabilities. So a big focus on ROS2 when they were designing it was to address those concerns. Um, specifically security. So that's where, I mean, Amazon did a lot of work there. We, um, because security is one of our strengths, we, um, we helped design the, the threat model uh, and the security, including um, DDS, which is one of the ways that all the messages are encrypted um, between the nodes. Um, but also from a reliability and quality of service perspective means that now with ROS2, you've got a situation where you can actually start building robots that can uh, be effectively, you know, uh, hardened to all the rigors of production. The other big benefit of ROS2 is that they, 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 they supported other operating systems other than Linux. Although to be honest, no one really uses uh, OS X and no one really uses Windows. So it's, it's still predominantly Linux. Is, is you, you, won't, you won't find anyone doing anything serious on those two. However, from a point of view of education and getting people started, um, it's a great, a great onboarding uh, mechanism. And at the bottom, you can see the, um, the, the pictures associated with the releases. So on the left, we've got the ROS1 and the, on the right, ROS2. So Foxy Fitzroy is the current ROS2 kind of gold standard and Neotic uh, Nemesis is the, um, is the, is the ROS1. So both of those are yeah, kind of running in parallel. Yeah, yeah, they're maintained. Uh, the other thing with, that Amazon is doing at the moment is help it, we're creating migration tools to help you migrate ROS nodes from ROS to ROS2, because, you know, ROS has developed tens of thousands of nodes, right, from all the manufacturers and all that kind of stuff, uh, and they need to be ported to move to work on ROS2. So, you know, you don't have such a big choice. Mm -hmm. So so we're creating tools to help help uh, help that so that anyone can um, can do that. So I've talked about the the, the kind of like the goals that there. Um, what it actually um, kind of looks like that fr from, from a practical perspective is that Apart from the kind of the underlying um, uh, kind of nodes and stuff, there are tools as well that you use when uh, when you start creating one. So Gazebo is a simulation physics engine. So you can think of it. Anyone who's done game development uh, and used Unreal, uh, for example, or Unity, it's kind of similar. You create worlds that have got physics properties and materials, um, and this is fundamental because if you think about um, if you want to create a robot and you want to um, test it out, you need an environment on which to test it, okay? And that environment's got to be realistic. And a good example is, um, and I'm gonna show the demo later on, we created a couple of years ago, this project to help people learn AI. It's a remote control racing car. It's got a camera on it. It's got a, hasn't got a pie actually. It's got a, um, has it got a pie? No, it's got a Jetson Nano thing on it. Yeah, it's got, no, it's got an Intel, Intel nut thing on it. Um, and, um, uh, what was, oh yeah. So, so we created, um, a, 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 a robotic simulator of it. So, um, this car has got a Ross version of it and, uh, we help, um, uh, students and, and customers create, uh, what's called a reinforcement learning model. Reinforcement is a, is a, uh, um, an approach to machine learning that, um, it, it's effectively senses the environment uh, you give it what's called a reward function so uh, very much similar to how you learn for someone to ride a bike or train a dog if you do something good you get a reward if you do something bad you ignore them and they soon learn very very quickly what's what behavior hopefully hopefully uh, to, to adopt that's kind of like a very simplified kind of like thing of what re reinforcement learning is and um with this with this project we helped um, you learn this by having this car, you create a reward function, which is a bit of Python code that tells you how you want this car to drive, what's good driving, what's bad driving. And we needed to put it in a racetrack. So we'll, actually, that demo actually is working. So we'll see that later on. But once you've got that, once you've created that model, we can then take it, put it on a USB stick and put it on this remote control card. And we've actually got a track. And so what we're training that model on at robot on has got to be reflective of the, of the of of the physics for example if i'm doing a remote control car on carpet versus laminate versus concrete versus something else the physics are very different okay so your model and your physics engine's got to have all the flexibility to allow you to test how your car or your robot for example in the irobot so if you've got a laminate floor versus carpet versus 
deep pile carpet versus rugs, your robot's going to behave very, very differently. And so the physics engine's got to be able to help you there, right? So um, the takeaway from this, okay, is that if you love doing things like Blender and Unity and all that kind of stuff, if you're more artistic, then, you know, this could be of interest to you because one of the things that I find a lot in the demos is they're kind of pretty sort of bare uh, and you need kind of like to import models uh, to, to, to make them more interesting. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's, that's something you don't have to necessarily do all the kind of hardcore robotic stuff. You can do all the, the model and, 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 and environment building. Then we've got tools like RViz and RQ, RQT, which basically allow you to actually interact with your virtual robot as if it was a physical robot. So the one in the middle, you can see it's going around and the kind of the blue and the purple um, colors are the data that's coming back from the LiDAR uh, sensor, so from the mapping. So it's actually um, showing how that robot is getting data so it can start building a map of the environment. And on the right, uh, this, this, this robot has got a camera. This is what that camera is seeing. And so you can use it. So what, one of the demos I, I, I've got um, is I have a, this kind of this house, pictures of people, and the robot goes around. I, I create a model uh, with the pictures with a name. And as it goes around, it says, ah, oh, hello, and then gives you your name. Um, that's the sort of thing you can do. It's a combination of you know, your robotic application, which is, in a sense, it's a machine learning model to detect people and faces, which you then put on the robot. I've not had to build a physical robot. But if I put that on a physical robot, it would go around and I could maybe make it make a noise or put a flag up or do something similar. Um, and then um, uh, the other part of this is actually, which I've kind of mentioned, is, the, is those simulated worlds. So this is the, the Mars one you can see on the left. Um, the one on the bottom left is a hospital, and that's a hospital helper. Um, and then the one on the right is a typical warehouse type situation. And so if I'm creating a, a robot, I want, to test it. I want to test it in these environments. I've not had to go to Mars because that's pretty expensive and there's quite a high latency there. Uh, and I, hopefully if I test it in a physics environment in a, gener in a generated world it, with enough different scenarios, um, I've got a better chance for my robot going out in the world. It's not ever going to be 100%, but it's a better chance than than you would otherwise. Um, there are a lot of companies who are doing stuff with the robotic operating system. So this is just a few of them. So this is kind of like left academia now, and it's gone into main mainstream main, uh, kind of uh, industry. So again, if you are interested in robotics and you want to get a job, then it's a good thing to start learning about. Uh, and we've got some customers I've talked about already. Um, and the other thing as well, we're doing a lot of work with universities. So, so I, I, I've um, done workshops with Edinburgh uh, University. They've got an amazing robotics uh, facility there. Um, Oxford and Cambridge as well in the UK. Cal Poly are probably doing the most that I'm aware of in, in, in um, California. Um, but, you know, from an academia perspective, many, many, many um, universities now have got a dedicated robotics division. And they're kind of like doing some really cool stuff here now leads us hopefully if the demo gods are smiling excellent they always sign to the geekery to, 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 to demos right so everything i've talked about so far is uh open source and uh at amazon what we've done is we've created um well one of the things that amazon does uh, and we do very well i think is we we help simplify and make it easy for to run these open source projects so that's what i kind of do i kind of help people do that and so all the stuff, all the open source stuff that I've showed um, is effectively what we're running on here. We've just made it much easier to do. Um, so a few clicks and uh, hopefully, and now I've got to try and make sure I, got to, I'm going to kick these off first um, because these take a few seconds to run. So there's two, these, these, these two demos are, um, one is a drone demo um, that will show effectively a real world environment, houses, a town, that kind of thing, and a, um, a robot drone. Uh, and the robot drone, um, the app, uh, ha is using AI to effectively, and, and a navigation um, uh, piece, to go from point A to point B in the house to do a, a similar a, a delivery and then to come back again, right? So if you're imagining, if you imagine, um, you know, if you were doing this for real, if you wanted to create a delivery service with drone, 
you know, you would need to ha- create so many different types of worlds with, uh, you know, different garden configurations, you know, trampolines, non-trampolines, a pet dog, you know, that kind of thing that kind of chases you. That kind of, So you need all, uh, a washing line. So, so, you know, this is where simulations really come in because it's so much easier to do that um, through, through uh, digital tools. So this is going to take a few, uh, few seconds to run. So whilst that's, run, whilst that's getting started, I'll, whoop, uh, I'll, I'll get the other, the other demos. Um, so first one is called VRX. Um, now this is another um, interesting challenge that's currently, why, is, why have I lost the, um, okay, here it is. So uh, let me to close this. All right, make sure. Okay, so let's do. Okay, so um, so this is um a challenge that's currently I think currently running, where they're using ROS to create um or develop um autonomous sailing devices or robots things that can go around the oceans and monitor the health of the oceans the seas um track um garbage or rubbish rather sorry you can tell i can work with them um, a lot of americans um and um uh so yeah so, so the, the the idea here is that you know in order to create these kind of robots we need to have a simulated environment so so this is the kind of a, 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 and and this is all open source. Um, they do challenge companies sponsor challenges and have competitions um, to do things like creating the best algorithm um, to to kind of like find stuff or go from A to B. Everything at the moment is running in Ireland. It's all running in Ireland. Somewhere in Ireland. And come on. And here we go. We've got our simulated environment. This is our boat. We can zoom in. Oh, you know what? I, 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 I can't, you know, I've just realized I always use a mouse mm-hmm. and I, don't, I have no idea how to do this without, oh, okay, it does, does work that way. I can pinch in, pinch out. Um, I can zoom in. So this is, this, so in this instance, my robot is, uh, is this thing here. And I can actually, um, get the control for it. So I need to go back all oh, this. Uh, how do I get rid of this bar here? Zoom, you're so annoying sometimes. Okay, right, we go. All right, so let's try in here. And hopefully, if that works, this should bring up a control panel. Oh, okay. So we can now see this is actually if we can zoom in, we can actually start seeing this is actually the kind of that, that's what's in this. Um, unfortunately, I'm not very good at navigating with the, with the control pad, with the, the track pad here, but you can kind of see this is like kind of all the composite parts of this particular model. Uh, all of these will be, will be nodes, and we can start seeing some of the sensor information uh, from. Uh, from this uh, from this robot so this is actually what the cameras are seeing and i think I, I can also do i think i can actually drive it which if i come out of this and kill that do this now this I'm not sure if it's going to work if I actually, uh, let's see if I can, I can, I can use keys here to kind of like go faster and slower, but I'm not actually sure if I can actually show it at the same time. So you can see it's moving now because I've actually, I've started um, effectively sending messages to some of the motors. The motors are switched on and it's now interacting with the waves. So it's going, it's going backwards and, and forwards. So, I mean, it's a very, very simple idea, sim- a demo um uh, that this one let's see if i can if i can go back to the uh, other one and see if it started yet oh this one's running so this is the car one uh, let's have a look car so is there a node for the sea or, or is it just nodes within the robot 
so the C, the C will, will be part of the actual um, physics environment. Yes. So it's not a node. No. So effectively, you have uh, gazebo in this instance is what's running the, the physics engine. You can have others. So the one I'm going to show you is using Carla, so Unity. Um, so there's a physics environment. And then the, the ROS tooling uh, effectively controls how the two interact with each other in, in a very similar way to kind of gaming. Mm -hmm. Same thing with games, right? You know, you, you create your world yeah. and then you create your models and you put your models in the world and then the actual middleware, so in this case, ROS, but the, the gaming engine takes care of all the physics stuff. Yeah. All right, so now let's, where is, where is Carla, drones and Carla, all right? Okay, so now this will be the world. So this is our, oops, yeah, I forgot, I forgot about this. Um, it's much easier when you've got uh, more That's screens, pressure, more yeah. screens That's than I've got. Cool. <laughs> yeah, more, more screens than I've got. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start adding, uh, I can't copy and paste here, which is really annoying. Um, I'm going to add into this world, um, Python, API examples uh, spawn oops, spawn oop, non player uh, dot py and this is where I normally find I've done a typo and I have to do the whole thing again or maybe not maybe it's going to work this time oh it's working right so what's good, what you'll start seeing now is um, Things. There we go. So these are all um, part of the, um, the, 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 the physics, the, 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 the simulation, right? So if I'm creating a self driving car, which let's, let's um, do that. So I'm going to create one. Why is, why is that doing twice? Ah, I must have done the wrong one then. Uh, yeah, that's fine. So now what I can do is I can go full on Tesla. Um, I could do self-driving, but I'll do a the, the, the Tesla version, which um, is basically using an AI model to interact with this environment um, and self-drive. And it's not, it's a terrible driver. Um, so automatic. Hopefully that will work. Oh, pants, why is that? I've obviously, I've obviously done a typo there. Python API. Our oh, examples. Automatic. Dot. Right, so now that should change. Here we go. So, oh, we've got, it's not Tesla this time. So what, what it's doing now, okay, is in this environment, which we spawned the 50 um, characters, <laughs> we've got now, now a car that's, been, that's using an uh, AI algorithm um, and it's self-driving. So obviously if you're in the self-driving uh, car business, this is super useful, right? Because you can test out new, new, new ideas, new algorithms, um, new road layouts and see how your model um, uh, creates without having to fear um, about you know killing right, people. Right. The reason why it's stopping is is because it's basically um, the way that reinforcement learning model works is it operates in, in its environment and it will um, collect data and it will then uh, store that data for later, process it, see how well it did, and then carry on. So it kind of does. And we'll, we'll see another example of that. So will it, will it change its model based on where it gets any reinforcement? It, it does. Well, it, so what happens is that. As your model gets trained, as you as you train your model, um, you hope that the model you've created, because it doesn't always work, converges so that you have effectively you always every time it trains it gets improves. If you've got a good model, that's what will always happen. It's, it's a linear. Well, it's not not completely linear, but it's always improving. If you do a poor model, what will happen is it will just go up, down, or flat, and then really it just it's, it's no better than just uh, putting a, a toddler in the car driving. Right, it just doesn't really won't really learn. So it, it's as much about the algorithm and, and, and your and your reward function as, as the actual um, algorithm themselves. I'm going to do the drone one now very quickly. Um, so here's here's our little um, 
here's our little drone. And again, more commands. So Python 3. So this one's called last mile. Exactly. Uh, we do a lot of um, last mile delivery uh, demos uh, for various things. But hopefully it'll start taking off. And we can use, I think if we, we can change the camera camera angle. Again, it's another thing of the physical engine. This is using Carla rather than Gazebo. So I can change the camera angles as well as, you, as you're going along to see how it's going. And what, it's gonna, what, what it will do is it will just basically go around. Um, it's been given a, a location for a delivery. It's now, hopefully it's not gonna hit anything because that would be unfortunate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's gonna navigate um, and you'll see it. It's, it's, quite, it's quite a fun, fun little um, demo. But uh, you can see it's like a, it's using probably a similar world to the, um, the driving one. A lot of those resources, um, people um, create and share. So that's another, another um, win really from an open source perspective is that quite often the resources that you need. So we've, we've made available resources, um, a, book short, a, book, a bookshop, obviously, a warehouse, a hospital, and uh, a factory. Um, and you can just basically use those uh, for your own simulations. Um, but other people have created other ones. There's some really amazing resources out there. So you can see our, our drone um, has uh, landed. You can see here messages here saying land complete. Um, and then in a few seconds, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take off and, and go back to base. So that's the, uh, that's the drone. That's the drone demo. And the one final um, demo. Uh, let me just stop that. That's all. I don't want to. Uh... So was that working out its route um, on the fly after taking off? Yes. Based on the sensors on board. Uh, based on the design. algorithm you've got. The, so the, your your um your application will will do, uh, you know depending depending on which mapping app mapping tool you're using, the mapping tool typically works out the best way, mm -hmm. which is why I mentioned it's a specific um, area of specialty. Um, normally, what happens depending on the robot. Sometimes you'll, you'll have uh, uh, robots that go and so we've got one demo that you get a robot, again, it's a digital robot, that you put into a, um, a, a, a simulated world. Actually, I'll show, I'll show this now, actually. So I mentioned about simulated worlds, right? So we've got a tool here called Worldforge that allows you to very quickly generate worlds. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna create a template. And what I can do here is I can create, uh, there's a, a couple of uh, um, things I can do here. Um, Browse templates. So I got, I've got a bedroom, living room, small house, one bedroom apartment. I can click on here. And then it tells me what kind of um, things do I want in, the, in, in this world, right? I can specify all these things. I can click on generate world and it'll take about probably five, 10 minutes. And then what will happen is you will get, oh, you'll get a world produced. So this one actually was, this, this has never been seen anywhere. Um, other than the geekery, um, this is my simulated world. Which obviously, if I was using, if I if I wanted to create the world's best um, autonomous vacuum cleaner, um, this would be a great uh, uh, environment in which to test it. Um, and that took me no effort to do, right? So you know, from the point of view of helping uh, simplify how some of these tools do, that's kind of what we do at Amazon, right? So um, if you're a customer, you would use that, um, and I'd focus on my robot. And I'd, I'd, I'd try it on here and, and I'd get data back to tell me how well it performed based on what I thought it was going to perform. So this is, this is the, um, the one that I couldn't get working. This, that's the Martian and this is the Mars rover. So this is an exact replica of the Mars Land Rover. And um, the demo is that you, 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 uh, uh, you navigate it until it finds, the, you know, uses the camera. You can see what the, what the, what the actual Mars rover is seeing through that small um, square in the middle. And then it's got a very simple AI um, uh, algorithm that looks for something green, uh, and it says, oh, "I found the Martian." So it's not, not nothing super sophisticated. Um, what I'm going to show you now, very quickly, is uh, uh, this thing, this, this this project we created, Deep Racer, to help people learn reinforcement learning. Um, this is kind of like a very probably the most basic racetrack you can probably get, more like a drag drag strip. Um, but effectively, what um, what I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you the one on the, bot the bottom. You can see that what we've got there is we've got the simulation, which is the racetrack um, in, that, in that box. We've got the robot, the, or the car, and then it's moving by itself. And this is our application. This is our reinforcement learning application that's basically learning to drive itself. 
and it, you'll see it kind of like stop and start. And what's happening is it will do this thousands and thousands of times. And over time, what happens is you create a model, you then deploy it on a physical car, and this is what it looks like, right? So um, I, I used to run workshops on this actually, and uh, I've got, I, I should have brought it in actually. I've got one of these at home. Um, now, this actually isn't that impressive because it's going quite slow. Um, we run at our big events. Um, uh, we have a racetrack there. We get customers to kind of do this. And the, the world record is 7.7 .7 seconds per lap at the moment. It's pretty, and it just whizzes around. Um, I think it's, I think it's J, uh, JP Morgan currently have got the world record on the fastest model uh, for this. But it's a super fun, super fun project. And we can show it, we can show it um, uh, running here by uh, doing this. And hopefully, um, there we go. So we've got the racetrack here. You can see the car is currently uh, stuck. So you can see here, it's got um, step, reward, step, reward. So the reward is the reward function. So when it's doing something good, it gets more reward. When it's doing something rubbish, it gets less. Every step is every iteration. And that's all, that data is all being collected. Um, and then we can navigate around. We can see, oops, we can zoom out, we can zoom in. And it's, it's going very slow at the moment. And that basically tells me that the reward function is uh, indexing on slow speed rather than high speed uh, to get more points. So, but what will happen is if we left this running overnight, then by the morning, uh, this thing will be whizzing around and we could then take the model that's created, put it on that physical car. And then um, in theory, it should drive itself. And I, I, I've run this workshop hundreds of times uh, and got people who have got no ex expertise in machine learning and they've all been able to get it running mostly around uh, the track. So that was the last demo, I think. So I think with that, I think I'm pretty much done. I think let's say, oh yeah. So I do have um, a couple more slides. Um, all, the, all the resources, all the code is on my GitHub repository, which you, I guess you'll share anyway. Um, and from an education perspective, um, we, uh, if, you're, if, you, if you work with students, the, the, the robotic specific area is one of the areas that we actually do touch upon. Um, and um, we even have badges that you can earn um, <clears throat> to, to, to go through the kind of curriculum. So it's quite a nice, nice, it's, it's, it's a much more simplified um, uh, sort of training course, but it gives you the basics of how to get started with Ross. So I think that's it. Thank you very much.